who fights for us. He will never fail. You will never fail. For your love. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes. Surround us with your light. Your love endures forever. Mighty is the one who's for us. Mighty is the one who's strong to save. He will make a way. You will make a way. For your love, for your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes. Open up our eyes. Surround us with your light. Your love endures forever. Our God is fighting for us. Our God is fighting for us always. Our God is fighting for us all. Our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. We are not alone. Our God is fighting for us always. Our God is fighting for us all. Our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes. Surround us with your light, your love endures forever open up our eyes open up our eyes surround us with your light your love endures forever amen our god is fighting for us always we need to be reminded of that we need to remember, like the Lord says, the battle belongs to the Lord. It's not our battle. It's God's battle to fight. And uh, we have a privilege. What a blessing it is to be here this evening, to hear these great speakers, and, and to be a part of this, and to get equipped for the battle. And uh, we have a privilege to be here tonight. Um, we're going to have a love offering right now. And I want you to just seek the Lord. If the Lord lays on your heart to give the Lord has blessed us. We had the privilege of having our brother come out and take part in this debate. Um, he drove from a far distance, and you know what? It's, it's been such a blessing. And so, you know what? We want to bless, and we want to be able to help him out and just uh, support his ministry, what he's doing, to equip the church, you know, for works of service as we reach Muslims for Christ. So as we, as we do another worship song, we're going to pass around the basket. And if the Lord lays it on your heart, you know, give unto the Lord and do it for his glory. All right. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. 
sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Sing it again. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Oh, sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation, with all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows, clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is power. Breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, with all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. For you, Lord, we thank you, Father, that you are the worthy one. You are the one who was slain to redeem us. And Lord, because of that, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor this evening, Father. Lord, we pray that you would continue to glorify yourself, Father, and bless the rest of the remainder of this evening, Father God. We thank you and we offer to you our praise and worship, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you can all be seated.
Okay, so we are now going to have We're going to have Defending Our God with uh, Reverend Andy, Anthony Rogers. Um, are we supposed to have a panel discussion? Is that what it is? After that, okay. So it's just you speaking right now. Okay, so for the next 30 minutes, uh, we're going to be speaking regarding Defending Our God. Okay, my, my understanding is that I would take something like 20 minutes to address a particular topic relevant to the Bible and the Quran, and then we would have a panel discussion regarding God. Now, of course, we already had two debates and hopefully got a full hearing on important things uh, related to our doctrine of God, as well as how that compares and contrasts with the Islamic doctrine of God. But in spite of the vague title of this particular talk, what George specifically wanted me to address <clears throat> is the question of deception. As you all probably know, the Quran attributes deception to Allah, not just something that Allah approves of, but something that Allah engages in. And I'm not going to go over all of those references for that, and there's easy way to track those down on the answeringislam.org website. Sam has numerous articles where he's talked about this. The Quran makes reference to Allah's deception, makes reference to Allah's guile, makes reference to even Satan saying the reason he's going to lead people astray is because Allah led him astray. So uh, that's clear in the Quran. And we have made this observation for many years that the Quran uh, teaches that Allah is a deceiver. In fact, Allah claims to be the greatest deceiver. In Surah 354 and Surah 830, Allah claims to be the best of deceivers. He talks about being crafty and so forth. And it's not surprising then if his followers would engage in the same sorts of things, even with respect to these verses, by the way. If you look at the translations of these passages, they almost never render them as deception. The Arabic word is makr, and it means uh, deception. Uh, and, and in fact, I did this whole study not long ago on my own website, just called Answering, uh, not website, but YouTube page, Answering, or excuse me, Anthony Rogers is his name uh, my, under my name. I did this whole thing just looking at Islamic translations mostly and how they deal with this. It's very interesting uh, to see that they're engaging in deception while trying to uh, deal with a passage that talks about Allah being the best of deceivers. So uh, th there's no question that this is something taught in the Quran or in the Islamic sources. And most fearfully, uh, the Quran and the Islamic sources teach that Allah's deception isn't limited to unbelievers. It also extends to his own followers and to his prophet such that the, one of the famous remarks is uh, of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr said he was one of 10 people that were promised paradise. Uh, 10 people were promised paradise. And if you know anything about uh, the Islamic approach to salvation and so forth, you know there's, there can be no assurance in Islam. And so to have this promise is about as good as it gets, a direct promise. 10 people were given this promise. Abu Bakr was one of them. However, even that wasn't sufficient to give Abu Bakr certainty. At one point when Abu Bakr expressed his concern about what was going to happen, uh, somebody said to him, why are you so concerned? Allah promised you paradise. And he said, even if I had one foot in paradise, I would not consider myself secure from Allah's deception. So Abu Bakr was concerned that he might be plunged into hell at, at the end in any case, even if he had one foot in paradise. So that's something you, you find in the Islamic sources. It's, it's very clear. And you even have Allah uh, deceiving Muhammad. In fact, Allah de deceived the followers of Jesus, we're told. The, the standard interpretation of Surah 4, 157 of the Quran, which says that Jesus, the, the Messiah, was neither killed nor crucified, the standard interpretation of that is that Allah made somebody appear to look like Jesus, and that's why others thought that Jesus was crucified and why his apostles thought he was raised from the dead because they saw him alive later, but he was never really crucified. It was somebody else. 
So the, the whole Christian faith was Allah's deception, a result of it. And that deception was one that his own apostles, Jesus' apostles, fell for. Uh, and Muhammad is deceived, according to Surah 8, other places. Allah deceived Muhammad to believe certain things, so he would do certain things. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to get into all this. I think you should go read Sam's articles on that, where you'll get all of the resources and so forth. But uh, the, the issue that comes up that people will sometimes ask, the Muslims try and return the favor, and here I'm not even going to tackle all of these either, but they'll, they'll uh, say that there uh, is deception in the Bible, and, you know, what do Christians say in response to some of this? And one of the classic texts is 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul speaks of certain people uh, uh, being given over to the lie, right, and, and, and being subject to a powerful delusion. And so the question is, well, isn't God then, uh, in some sense, implicated in deception? Well, that's not the only text they'll appeal to. Again, this isn't comprehensive. But just with respect to that text, uh, there's several things that need to be observed here. In the first place, this isn't, even if we wanted to give it the worst spin and say this is God deceiving and so forth, notice it's not God's people, it's not believers, so it at least has that over the Quran, right? It, it's not it's talking about God deceiving his own people, but it's not even talking about God himself deceiving others in, in the sense, the relevant sense, that Islam claims Allah deceives others. In the context, what you have is a judicial act on the part of God. It's not, in fact, it's not even talking about God causing people not to believe the gospel or not to believe the truth about Christ. The statement of the text is that they already don't believe the gospel. Right? They don't believe, and so it says that God will give them over to the lie. Okay, they're being given over to this. They've already rejected the truth, and now they're being given over to the lie. What is the lie? Well, in the context, it's talking about... Uh, you know, the coming of the man of sin, the, the man of perdition, doomed to destruction, and, and so forth. So they're going to fall hook, line, and sinker for whatever this is going to involve, this, this man of sin and, and these sorts of things. And so uh, there, there's nothing uh, in this text and, and, or, or the other texts that, that implicate God in deception, but they do certainly show that God is sovereign, but that's not really the debate between Christians and Muslims with respect to the issue of deception. God is sovereign over everything. I, I love the remark of Luther. Uh, youth, Luther used to say that, you know, the, the devil's like, uh, you know, a, a rabid dog, right? Or as the Bible, as Peter said, like a roaring lion, right? But, but Luther was talking about the devil being a rabid dog, a wild dog. But he said he's still God's devil, meaning that Satan is on God's leash, Satan can't do anything, can't go anywhere that God himself is not ultimately sovereign over. The leash only goes as far as God lets him. And uh, so we certainly grant that God is sovereign over all things, including the deception that other people do. No deception could prevail uh, in God's world unless he allowed it. Uh, but uh, uh, this isn't the same thing as saying God himself lies, God approves of lies, uh, or God is deceiving his own people. There's a clear and marked distinction between the character of God in the Bible, the character of Allah in the Quran, and what these two sources teach. Uh, so that's basically all I was going to say on this topic. I don't know if I even went 15 minutes or not, uh, but uh, George just wanted me to do something sort of to, just to introduce uh, this whole idea of the character of God, the attributes of God, and... Um, the concept of God and so forth in, in Christianity. So I hope that was of some use to you, but like I said, go read Sam's articles. Uh, he also addresses other texts like Jeremiah. Sam, Sam's uh, sort of scoffing at me. I'm saying I'm, I'm offloading this on Sam. Maybe this is me being lazy because I'm, I'm tired, but, the <laughs> but uh, no, I do think that those are the best things to, to look at anyways, because you've got all the resources there. Uh, you've got it all right in front of you. Uh, you know, he, he quotes uh, the, the Arabic lexicons, Lane's lexicon, uh, and so forth, showing you how the word is used. You can go watch my video on my YouTube page, Anthony Rogers, and I, I go through how Muslim scholars translate this. And you can see it. You can see the deception in the translation of, of these verses, Surah 354 and Surah 830. So I'll, I'll conclude with that, and then uh, I, I don't know if we do questions. Oh, we have Jim Baber. He's not here. 
Um, oh, okay. So I think Jim is coming up and we're going. On? Perfect, thank you. All right, gentlemen, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you guys a series of, of, of questions really on very broad topic. Um, I think we got what 45 minutes on this. Um we're gonna call it the uh it's the concept of God. You can see it in, in the outline that, that you picked up. So I, I want you, the audience, to keep this in mind too, is Muslims have objections, as if you've been here, you've already seen, to the person, nature, and work of Jesus Christ. They have, they have um, criticisms and disagreements with us of the nature of the Godhead. But their criticisms are not unique to Islam. You run into a oneness Pentecostal. You run into a Unitarian Universalist. You run into a Jehovah Witness. It's the same stuff. Matter of fact, I, I am convinced that a lot of the early Muslim arguments, they ripped off from Jehovah Witnesses. I got a Quran at home dated 1917, which is just a fantastic outline. Could have been written by a Jehovah Witness, but it was written by Muhammad Ali. And, and I, anyway, I don't, I don't want to divert too much, but I think that's where a lot of it came from. Just to you clarify, agree? not the boxer Muhammad Ali. I'm sure you're referring yeah, to yeah. Muhammad Malana. Yes, yes. Who was an Ahmadi, if I'm, if I remember correctly? Yeah, an Ahmadiyya Muslim, which is not really a Muslim. If you're in Pakistan, they get you killed. So, uh, anyway, um, so keep that in mind. That I think you know. So, so some of the questions I'm going to ask may seem rather broad, and, and yeah, they are broad. But yes, it does pertain to Islam. But I want you to remember too that these other religions pertain to them too, and uh, so it's all very, very universal. with a, a question for you anthony and so let me ask you this the quran does it attempt attempt to define the trinity and i think the answer would be yes so when we hear from our most first first of all i want you to comment on the quran's attempt to define the trinity and then when we engage our muslims how they either use or don't use what their own quran says about the trinity yeah <laughs> So the Quran does refer to the Trinity. There's all sorts of discussions swirling about this. The, uh, there's a clear, as you read each of these passages, it, it, so first of all, it's clear that the Quran thinks that the doctrine of the Trinity is belief in three gods. Muslims will sometimes say it says, say not three, it doesn't say three gods. So we're not, the Quran's not in error regarding what Christians believe. We're not saying three gods, we're just saying three. It can't, you know, you no, don't say three at all. The problem is the, the, the juxtaposition in that uh, ayah, it says, say not three, Allah is only one God, right? The juxtaposition is between saying three and saying Allah is one God. So there, it's very clear that the Quran is saying three gods. In all of the, the statements of the Quran, Surah 4171, Surah 5116, all the passages that talk about uh, relevance, uh, things relevant to the Trinity, it always speaks specifically of Christ and his mother. And then it gives you what should, you know, Muslims think are arguments against their deity. Now, normally when they talk to Christians, by the way, they'll, they'll specifically talk about Jesus and they'll say he had to eat food. He went to the bathroom, right? These sorts of things. The Quran doesn't just say that about Jesus. It says it about Mary. The reason they don't bring up Mary, too, is because they realize Christians don't really believe Mary is one of the members of the Trinity. But that's what the Quran is doing. The Quran is saying that there are three, and Mary and Jesus are the other two. So the Quran doesn't accurately define the doctrine of the Trinity. And Muslims go into every conversation with that bad understanding in mind. And it, for that reason, becomes a roadblock for them. Because think about it, when... If it's usually in any discussion, one of the things you have to do is, is be clear on your definitions. The problem then, you know, we can't even discuss if this is true unless we know what we're talking about. 
But the problem for a Muslim is he can't even accept that this is the accurate definition from us because that already involves denying the Quran. If that's the accurate definition, the one I'm giving, that God is one God and three persons, and that, but you would all give as Christians, for, it, for them to even admit that definition is to admit the Quran is wrong. And so that's what makes it a very difficult conversation. And sometimes they'll even act like they really, they do understand you, they agree with you, they might even accurately define it, but then they'll turn around and make an argument that presupposes a different understanding of it. Uh, so yeah, the Quran gets the Trinity wrong, and that leads Muslims to a false confidence. They think that they understand what the doctrine of the Trinity is. And it makes the discussion and progress in the discussion difficult because it's hard to get even past definitions with Muslims. So, uh, so Eddie, we are, and many of us here already have, you're not witnessing. And someone just says, and a Muslim will say, oh, the Trinity, it's so confusing, right? You Christians are so confused. And so then we as a Christian want to, well, let me explain it to you. It's like ice. Talk to us about analogies to use and not to use. Don't use any analogies because no analogies fairly define the Trinity. So don't use them because most, virtually all of them either describe a oneness doctrine of God like ice. I think it was T.D. Jakes that used ice and all oneness use ice because it's, it's perfect for their, as a description to their Unitarian theology that the, the deity Jesus became the son and he's the father simultaneously, just, you know, the ice analogy, um, the egg and all these other things. Some describe a Mormon doctrine. Don't use any analogies. A Christian that I think, this is my view, a Christian that uses analogies is really saying this. I just don't understand how to define the Trinity from scripture. I don't know. So I'm going to use ice. I don't know what else to say. Don't use ice. Don't use any analogy. Instead, why can't we just use the biblical data? Scripture defines that there's one being, as Anthony so effectively pointed out, being does not constitute person in Scripture. When we see the doctrine of one God, it does, it's not tantamount to universalism. Monotheism does not equal universalism. There's no passage that says God is one person. In fact, there's several different Greek words in the New Testament that, that can be translated as person. It's not just one, it's not just one term. As Shabir erroneously pointed out, there's many words that can be translated as person, and they're utilized. Jesus used personal pronouns to define the Holy Spirit. He uses third person personal pronouns of the Spirit. He uses first personal pronouns to himself. He uses second and third pronouns personal pronouns to define the Father and the Spirit as well. So Jesus was satisfied using personal language that just normally in language denotes personhood. He was satisfied in doing that. The Bible, the data for the Trinity is simply this. There's one being, not one person, but one God. But yet in Scripture, both in the Old and New Testament, we find there's three persons who are divine and the creator of all things. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're the only ones that have been revealed as God, as Yahweh, as the creator of all things. Then we find the third premise here is that each person is grammatically distinct. Even without going to languages, just read the plain text, you'll never get the idea that Jesus is the Father or Jesus is a separate God from that of the Father if you just allow any recognized translation. So one God, it's the first premise. Second premise, there's three persons who are called God who are referred to as Yahweh, not merely an agent, but ontologically as Yahweh and referred to as the creator of all things, but yet the third premise they're distinct. They're not each other. Jesus prayed to the Father. Only persons pray to each other, right? The Holy Spirit in Romans 15, 30 gives love. Only persons love in that sense. These are personal attributes. 
in John 10, 17, Jesus says, the Father loves me. He's not saying I myself, as a divine mode, love my human nature. I love my own self. There's clear IU references, right? So don't use analogies. Just use the biblical data. One God, three persons called God, referred to God, presented as God, ontologically. And thirdly, they're distinct from each other. Over and over, just not one passage, but over and over and over, a vast amount of passages that teach this very thing. So, Anthony, let's talk about the Quran again. The Quran presents a Jesus. I mean, I, I heard from our debater tonight. Jesus was pretty much just a prophet, just a man. So could I say that that's really indeed how the Quran presents Jesus? Just a prophet, just a man? You could say that. I can say that, but can I support it? Let me say that, yeah. So the Quran to me is is really a hodgepodge of things. One thing to remember, I, mean, I mentioned it in the debate, you know, the Quran says, that, you know, if it's from other than Allah, there'd be found in it much discrepancy or much contradiction. Yeah, that's what I find there. Uh, the author of the Quran didn't know any better, though. And so he thought he could confidently make this claim that, oh, there's just, you know, it's all this, it's just completely consistent. But what we know to be the case is the author or authors of the Quran were familiar with all sorts of different things, but didn't really know where these things fit in, uh, in terms of Jewish belief, Christian belief, that sort of thing. So you find apocryphal sources being quoted. You just find all sorts of things uh, being incorporated into the Quran. Uh, but uh, they're they're divorced in, in many ways from their original context, and so you know what do you make of some of these things? But but as an example, um, there, there's a, you know the statement in the Quran where it says that uh, uh, say not I mean not to go to an excess in your religion. You know don't say about Jesus anything but the truth. He was uh, a messenger of Allah and His word. It says. Now, it almost seems like the verse is trying to say, well, oh, there's, there's, you know, don't say more about Jesus than you should. He's just a man. He's a messenger. But then it calls him God's word, Allah's word. And so you're like, well, wait a minute. Either the author doesn't know what it means to call him Allah's word, or the author's trying to say more about Jesus than that he's just a man. Now, uh, what's interesting, what's always, what's been interesting to me, and I've mentioned this in some contexts uh, more fully than I'll do now, but What's interesting to me is this, the idea of God having an eternal personal word, not a mere utterance, but a personal word who's called, a person who's called the word, uh, that you find that in the Old Testament. It's not, it's not made up. It wasn't even made up by the Targums. But in Genesis 15, it talks about God's word appearing to Abraham. Right? You have to follow the language here. God's word appeared to Abraham. It doesn't it's not, it's not talking about Abraham hearing God's word. He does in the context, but it's the word that appears. It's the word that speaks to Abraham. It's the word that takes Abraham outside. Okay, You find the same thing numerous times in the Old Testament. You have uh, uh, something similar to this already in Genesis 3, when the literal Hebrew says that they heard the voice of God walking in the garden. Right? It doesn't say they heard God's voice in the garden. They heard God's voice walking in the garden. Uh, the, the word of God, the kol Yahweh. Uh, so uh, this concept was used by ancient Jews as a way of referring to the angel of the Lord. They, they used this title. And that's ultimately what uh, John is doing in John 1.1 when he calls Jesus the word. He's taking a title that's already there in the Old Testament, was well known to first century Jews, and he's saying that word is Jesus, Right. Muhammad is, you know, picking this sort of stuff up uh, like, you know, a dog picks up fleas. A dog doesn't know where it gets fleas, right? It just, uh, these fleas are here. I don't, you know, I don't know where I got them. Uh, and and uh, he's, he's employing these things in the Quran, but he ends up creating a mess for himself. Right? And I don't, I don't know that, I, you know, there, there are different theories for some of this stuff. You know, some people would say that Muhammad was actually influenced by "Quote unquote Nestorians," and so what? It, when it looks like he's denying that Jesus is uh, God, he's really just denying the heresy of Nestorianism. Uh, there, there are all these different theories for that. 
The bottom line for me is just this. He calls Jesus by a title that in the authentic scriptures where the title come from, comes from, it means it, it's a divine, referring to a divine person. And one other thing real quickly, just uh, to sort of show you something of why I think he gets this even from the Targums. There's a statement in the Quran that most people who've read the Quran will be familiar with. Uh, when Allah creates something, how does he do it? It says, uh, the Quran says, kun fayakun, be and it is. He says, be and it is, okay? Well, that's a good description of how God created according to Genesis, but it's not exactly the language of Genesis. It's the language of the Targums. But here's what's interesting. According to the Targums, the one who said be and it is was God's word, his memra. It was the memra, the logos, the word of God who said be and everything came into existence. So here's the Quran calling Jesus the word and using a phrase that is attributed to the word in the Targums. Okay. This creates a huge problem for Muhammad, and Muslims have to try and skate around this. I have a whole video, by the way, uh, if you go on the Acts 17 apologetics page. It's called Mutilating Allah, and it, I don't know where David Wood is here, but I have like four other videos in that series that he hasn't released yet. They've existed for like a year. But anyways, uh, the first video of that series has been released, and I discussed this. And again, there's articles on Answering Islam that go into, it, into some more detail. All right. And, and, and I'd like one or both of you to correct me if I, uh, I'm stating this incorrectly. Did I hear Shabir Ali talk about the Trinity and the Council and I see it tonight? Yeah. You're, you're going to run into that. Trinity was created in the Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea did everything. Bad. You just, they just did it, right? Okay. So talk to us about the Council of Nicaea and the creation of the Trinity. The creation of the Trinity. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of precepts here. There's a lot of... Uh, normally when someone says that, the, they just demonstrate how unread they are in church history. I mean, these are basic stuff, basic things. They really are. Um, in brief, the Council of Nicaea actually emerged around the beginnings of it, uh, at least the reasons for it, uh, uh, emerged around 318 AD, 318. When Arius, Arian the heretic was teaching that Jesus was created. He was using the same arguments as a Jehovah's Witness would today. It caused so much commotion around Alexandria. We read from people that were there, there was fighting in the streets over this issue. Now today, if there's some heresy in the church, no one cares. Nobody cares. You know, it, we, we're embracing a doctrine of tolerance. Nobody cares. But back then, the Christians cared. The Christians really did. There was fighting in the streets. But this guy, and the, this phrase may have, I don't know, but this phrase may have originated because Arian was, Arius the Heret, Arian the heretic was described as tall, dark, and handsome. And he was a great speaker. And what happens when you get a heretic that's a great speaker? Everyone follows because they don't care about the doctrine. I mean, Christians, I'm talking about Christians. They like the good speakers the good looking guy that speaks really well, right? That's what he was. Yeah, Epsilon. <laughs> well, it caused so much commotion that the emperor Constantine did, want, did not want a disunified empire. He wanted unification. You know, that's what good leaders want. So at the advice of one of his theological confidants, Horsius, he arranged a council to deal with this, this problem because Arius was gaining a lot of followers. So it's, we read that about over 300 bishops showed up at this, this council. But the main issue there, the, mer the very main issue there was simply this. What was the relationship between Christ and the Father? That's it. It was not a Trinitarian council. That was already established. We have a vast amount of quotations from pre fourth century church fathers establishing, better than a lot of people do it today, the Trinity. So that, was our, that wasn't even the issue, nor was the canon of Scripture. That wasn't even an issue. 
at, at, the, at the Nicene Council. The issue was simply, what was the ontological by nature relationship between the father and son? Was he of the same substance? Here's the three propositions. Was he of the same substance? That's our view. That's the orthodox view. And they would use a term that meant same substance, homoousios. Or was he a different substance? That's what Jehovah's Witness would use today and everyone who denies the deity of Christ, but that was Arian's position. Arian's position was he was of a heterousios. But of course, unfortunately, there was people that want to be politically correct, so you had Eusebius and some others. Hey, can we just get along and say he's like the same sub or like substance? Uh, um, homoousios. You know, they had another term. They threw that in. But um, as we read from the people that were actually there, the conclusion was Jesus Christ was of the same substance. And as Athanasius says, we derive these things from Scripture, which is sufficient above all things. And the people that were there affirmed this. Unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't last very long because some people started to revert to uh, Arianism. But the fact of the matter is it had nothing to do with the Trinity. The Trinity was already established, and I would challenge anyone who makes that assertion, show me one document that came out of Nicaea, one document, it even has the word Trinity. So wasn't a Trinitarian council. All right, let's, Anthony, take this one here. Muslim, Muslim objections sought tonight. No matter what you said, you were told what to believe. Okay. And you were told that, um, you know, I mean, this is a common objection we all hear. Jesus ate food. He went to the bathroom. He died. How, you know, all these things happen, and yet you guys call him God. I'll, so take this any way you want, but help us in answering that, because we're going to hear those objections from Muslims, that, as, we, as we heard tonight. What, what is a Muslim misunderstanding, and how can we talk to them to bridge that gap? Yeah, one of the things you heard Shabir say, he, he was desperately struggling on the hook trying to show that we have a problem and it, it's even worse than what any problem I might present concerning his view. But he had to constantly keep misrepresenting what it is that we believe as Christians in order to even generate that kind of an argument. But for example, he said that Jesus died. Well, how can Jesus die if he's God? Isn't that a paradox? But it'd only be a paradox if Jesus wasn't one person with two natures, right? Now, I would grant that one person with two natures is not part of our normal experience, right? That goes beyond our experience. We don't know any other being that has two natures. But that has nothing to do with logic. I hope you understand. Uh, logic has to do with the relationship of propositions to each other, right? It's not about, uh, it's not the same thing as talking about whether, you know, but I'll give you an example. Is there anything illogical about believing in unicorns? horses that have horns. No, there's no violation of any law of logic in that belief. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means there's nothing rational or irrational about that. It might go beyond experience, right? We don't know of any being in our experience that's a horse-like being that has a, a horn, okay? Those are two separate issues that Muslims constantly confuse. Because Jesus is a kind of uh, being that goes beyond what we know of any other being, oh, that's just irrational. You know, but no, the, the, the doctrine of the incarnation solves the problem they think that we have. There is no problem there. How could Jesus, uh, you know, how could Jesus, if he's God, die? Well, I've got a theory for you. The word became flesh. If Jesus was God, how could he eat? I've got a theory for you. The word became flesh. If Jesus was God, how could he grow and so forth? The word became flesh. That's already addressed in the New Testament. We know how it all happened, right? Now, uh, I mean, there's other things I could say, but let me just make this observation. You heard Shabir admit that the Quran is eternal. Okay, this is this is not new stuff. I didn't originate this observation, right? The Christians have recognized this. Muslims have struggled over this. They had their own equivalent of the Council of Nicaea concerning the Quran. What do we say about the Quran, right? Given that it's supposedly Allah's speech. But wait a minute, didn't you hear Shabir say that the book in front of me, the Quran, the paper, the ink, all that's created? Which means I could theoretically burn the Quran. So in some sense, the Quran is eternal, but, in, but now you can burn it, right? So he's saying that the Quran has two natures somehow. Somehow there's something about it that's eternal, 
and something about it that's not eternal. The paper and ink is not eternal, but the 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 words, right? The, not the the physical uh, stuff on the page, but the the thought content and, and the, the verbal uh, vehicle for that. That's eternal. So he's he is positing that very thing. And that wasn't my objection, by the way. I, I don't have an objection to him thinking of uh, my my problem is for for Shabir and other all other Orthodox Muslims as they think of of this speech as something other than Allah, and that's just not monotheism, right? That's that's polytheism. So, thank you. So Eddie, I want to I want to continue on the topic of, of the Trinity, and because we as Christians, you're, you're going to get challenged in this area. Right, in, in, a, in a number of, you're going to be asked to explain, like, like you already said, don't use analogies, but you're going to be asked to explain it by a number of groups, like I said, not just Muslims, but really lots of the other groups that are like Muslims. How come, and, 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 and I know I've, I've done this before, I've, I've asked some Christians, hey, what, what is the Trinity? And they, they stumble, they, they just can't explain it at all. Why is it so many of our Christian brothers and sisters absolutely cannot, do not understand this, thereby, they, and they're not going to explain it if they don't understand it. Why the lack of knowledge? Um, I, I put the chief blame on Christian leaders. You go to most, and, and I, I speak a lot of place, at a lot of places, not only here, but outside the country, and I always ask this question when I speak on these kind of topics. Who here in the last 10 years has ever heard a message specifically on the Trinity? I don't get any hands. I've asked that question over and over at churches around the world. Nobody's teaching the Trinity. I mean, yes, there are some places that do, but by and large, some of the largest churches and smallest churches, the pastors, the leaders that are, that are commissioned, that are commanded to be teachers, are not teaching the very marrow of the gospel how God revealed himself. They're not teaching it. So why should Christians understand anything about it? The whole Christian idea of evangelism these days is John 3.16, and then they'll throw in Jeremiah 29.11. That's not really the gospel. Or they'll tell you how much God loves you and how he has a great plan for your life, and this is your best life now. That's not the gospel. But how would they know? They're not being taught. Because the pastors, I guess it's just not something that they're interested in. So I, I look at that as the very chief main reason why too many Christians, not all of them, too many Christians have no idea or they lack a definition of the Trinity. Now, they can tell you about end times, and they, they can explain the rapture and they, all these other things. But none of that's the gospel. But that's why I don't see it being taught. It's just not being taught because pastors themselves don't understand it. They just reduce the Trinity to a mystery. They'll take a passage in 1 Timothy 3 that specifically is referring to the incarnation, and somehow, because they lack the knowledge, they don't know how to teach it, they don't want to teach it, they'll just say, it's a mystery, so let's just move on to other things. So that's why, in my view. If I can add to that. Please. So I actually... Uh, I'm a pastor and, and uh, happily don't, uh, not guilty of what Eddie was saying, but I, I certainly concur with what he said. That's true. You find that all over the place. And I would just say one of the things that accounts for that, why pastors won't preach on it, is not only because you're talking about something that goes beyond our normal experience, and some people find that difficult, but because they don't see the practical relevance of the Trinity. And pastors are often trying to be practical. But let me point out something to you, and this is just touching the surface, something practical about the doctrine of the Trinity. One of the things that we confess as believers, and you'd even hear a Muslim say this, a Jewish person say this, we believe that God is self-sufficient. He is independent. That's part and parcel of what it means to be a theist. You believe that God is self-contained. He has all that he needs, is all that he is in and unto himself. He doesn't have to look outside of himself for anything. He's not dependent on anything, right? You only have that in the doctrine of the Trinity, okay? Outside of the doctrine of the Trinity, you have a God who is contingent on things outside of himself in order to realize 
certain hidden potentialities, right? God is not an essentially communicative being apart from the doctrine of the Trinity. Who is he communicating with, right? Which means that he needs the created world in order to be a communicating, speaking God. He's also not a God who is inherently uh, fulfilled in terms of fellowship, uh, you know, all of these sorts of things. One of the, so as Christians, we can say that God is not only self-sufficient, but precisely for that reason, he can be all-sufficient for us. It's not a flaw to say that God doesn't need us. That's the very solution to our problems. Precisely because he doesn't need us, we can look to him for all that we need, right? The, the reason, you know, some people are frustrated with their relationships because they're looking in, in that other person for the, the fulfillment of all these other desires. And I'm not saying that relationships aren't important and there isn't something that's answered in these relationships that we, we have by virtue of these relationships. But no relationship can fully satisfy any of that. Only the God of the Bible can fully uh, be sufficient to us in all our needs. And if people got that, then, you know, there'd be less frustration. You know, this person, you know, they're not fulfilling this or not. I'm, you know, I'm thinking, you, when did you ever expect any person to be able to do that? It, you're looking in all the wrong places. Okay. But again, I'm not chopping on marriages, but remember what marriage is a picture of, right? It's, it's a picture of, uh, you know, Christ in the church, but it also, uh, you know, it, it, it also images in some respect what's true in God, that there is this relationship. I'm not saying the person of the Trinity are married. That's not my point. But you do have this internal relatedness in God. And, you know, that's why when God created man in his image, it says male and female created he them. That's the image of God. It's included in the image, that it involves a plurality of persons. When you have the fuller account in Genesis 2, what Shabir would say is a is the Eloistic, you know, that's a Jehovistic account, right? The documentary hypothesis. Uh, when you get the fuller account in Genesis 2, uh, you have first the creation of Adam. And then what does it say? It's not good for the man to be alone. Therefore, I'll, I'll make a... That's the image of God, is, is uh, man uh, together in, in, uh, in a relationship. Um, and it's not a whole thing about all of that. There's more that could be said. But I, I was just trying to give everyone an idea of how this is very practical. It's not just this abstract teaching. We have a God who is all-sufficient and therefore uh, is sufficient for us. Okay. Along that line, let me, let me ask you this. Muslims will challenge us outside of a mosque if we go and we evangelize them. And they'll just say, show me in the Bible where Jesus says, I am God. Show me. Because they, all, they say that expecting that they already know in their mind it's not there. And they got you. Right? Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Yeah, a lot of problems with that. Uh, one thing is... The Bible has a certain pedagogy. I, I tried to kind of lay it out in my opening presentation on the Trinity, uh, the, the, the flow of Scripture and how these things are being said. Remember in the New Testament how Jesus approached certain issues. He said, for example, in Luke 16, the man, uh, or so uh, the rich man and Lazarus both die. The rich man was, was not a righteous man. He goes to Hades and he's in torment. And then he sees Lazarus afar off in Abraham's bosom and he's begging Lazarus to relieve his suffering. And then he says, well, go, go and warn my brothers. And then Abraham says, no, no, he, they're not going to believe even if someone rises from the dead. He says, they have Moses and the prophets, right? Th let them hear them, okay? So those who don't hear Moses and the prophets aren't going to hear the, the, the truth of, of the gospel, even if someone rises from the dead, Jesus said in Luke 16, okay? So what's the order there? The order is the Old Testament, and it leads to Jesus. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me, John 5. Luke 24, Jesus tells the disciples on the road to Emmaus, why were you so slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written? Over and over again, he takes them back to the Old Testament and says, this leads to this. When Muslims, you hear Muslims saying things like, God can't appear, right? He can't enter into his creation. Well, if they read the Old Testament, they'd know that's not true. God can appear. He can assume human form, right? Genesis 18, God appeared with two angels in the form of a man. Are angels men? No, but they were able to appear that way, right? And so did God. This anticipates the incarnation. It shows that God could do that if he wanted to. Genesis 32, God even wrestles with a man, right? So if they had learned the lesson that was taught in the Old Testament, then they would have, the way would have been prepared for the gospel. Uh, the ancient fathers like Tertullian 
uh, and later Calvin, so many others would say that these were like dress rehearsals. This is God trying on the clothes of his future incarnation. He's getting ready for what he's about to do. So the Jews had no excuse when Jesus comes and he makes claims about himself. But that, that's getting to what I'm talking about, or to your question. In the Old Testament, when God's doing all of this, he's establishing uh, phrases, terminology, motifs, all these sorts of things that are going to come up in the, in the New Testament. Here's a motif as an example. We often miss it because, you know, we're, we are reading translations, and this is part of the why, you know, it's the job of a pastor to point these things out, and people can also read commentaries and theological works and stuff like that. But uh, often people think that the I am statements of Jesus go back to Exodus 3. I'm not saying there's no relationship there, but the, actually a better connection is Deuteronomy 32, 39, where in the Hebrew, it's, uh, it's any who. God says, see now that I am any who. And in Greek, it's ego and me. See now that I am, there's no God besides me. I put to death, I make alive. I have wounded, I, I'm the one who heals. There's no one who can deliver or snatch out of my hands. Now, just think about that last part for a second. Have you ever heard a statement like that anywhere? There's no one who can snatch out of my hands or deliver out of my hands. Who said it? Jesus, right? In John chapter 10. The occasion when Jesus said that is, is what's the, the Feast of Tabernacles, basically. Uh, or second tabernacles because of, uh, uh, that's a long story, but it's basically the Feast of Tabernacles. I'll get into that some other time. What else happened at the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, we know that the Jews were supposed to sing Deuteronomy 32. This is according to Jewish custom. They sang, the, the law of Moses required reading the Torah every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles. The end of the Torah is Deuteronomy 32 through 34. So they would have been reading this if nothing else. They read it every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacle. I mean, and they sang it every year, not just every seven years. They sang it at the temple in the evening, okay? Again, this is Jewish sources. This is what they say. They sang the song of Moses from Exodus 15 in the morning, Deuteronomy 32 in the evening. It's a song. Moreover, the song is about, it, it's, it's, it's frightening in a sense. The song was taught to Israel according to Moses in Deuteronomy 31 as a witness against them in the future when they would commit apostasy against the Lord. Okay, so this was a song about their apostasy in the latter days. Okay? And then God says that when they commit apostasy, he's going to hide his face from them. Okay? So now, remember, Feast of Tabernacles, John chapter 8. Actually, it starts in John 7, goes all the way through 10. What does Jesus say in John 8? Three times, in fact, Jesus calls himself I am in that text. In John 8, 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. John 8, 28, he makes another I am statement. John 8, 58, he makes the most famous one of all, before Abraham became I am. All that's uttered on the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. When they would have sang this song and the words would have been ringing in their ears. But now think about this. When they wanted to stone Jesus, what did they do? I mean, what did he do? We're told that he hid his face from them and departed from the temple. What did God say he would do when he came to them in the future in, in Deuteronomy 32? It's all, it's all, all, in other words, this is all how God was preparing them. They should have seen these things. That's why they wanted to stone him, because they did realize he was claiming to be God. And last comment real quickly, and Eddie could go on for hours on this, but Muslims are mistaken in thinking that if Jesus claimed to be God, then he would have done it the way they dictate. Well, part of being God means he wouldn't do it the way you dictate, right? But, uh, uh, he did it in a way that actually goes well beyond what they're asking for. The word God is not the strongest way to affirm uh, the deity of Christ. Uh, the word God ordinarily is used for the true God, but it was also used to refer to judges. I mean, we know we can tell that when it's, there's a difference, right? When it's not, when it is being used in its proper sense, but it is used in, in, at times uh, for something that's other than God. But the word Jehovah Jews admit this. It's incommunicable. They called it the Shem HaMeyehud or the uh, Shem HaMaforesh, which means the unique name, the distinctive name, the name that belongs to God alone. It's never given to creatures. So for Jesus to be called Jehovah, that far exceeds Jesus being called God because it specifically identifies him as the God of Israel, okay, the only true God. And, and so, I'll, yeah, I'll conclude with that. Thank you. So we might run into a sophisticated Muslim who says, okay, okay, 
So you may want to tell me, Mr. Christian, that um, in the New Testament, they had the concept of the Trinity. But they didn't have it in the Old Testament. Jesus wasn't even born yet. How can Jesus be part of a Trinity and it's in, and you got Old Testament believers, do they have to believe in the Trinity? Is the Trinity in the Old Testament? Right, and, and I know Anthony did a, a tremendous job tonight laying that out, so I don't have to go far on, on this, but the Old Testament is replete with Trinitarian references. Um, now, if you got to keep in mind, it's like the question of salvation. If the apostles and the New Testament, not only the apostles, disciples, and even enemies affirmed, at least the enemies affirmed that he was claiming he was God, and the apostles, virtually in every epistle, the deity of Christ is implicitly referenced or explicitly referenced in every single epistle, right? Jesus himself held to a Trinitarian concept. We see that all over the place when he claims he's deity, when he claims the Father is deity, when he has interaction with the Father, when he um, affirms who the personality of the Holy Spirit. So the premise that, or the assertion that the Old Testament believers believe something different than the New Testament believers. Now, unfortunately, a lot of Christians have that view. They think the Trinity first emerged in the New Testament, but the problem with that view is you would be implying that it was a different concept. They had a different concept of God in the Old Testament than the, what they had in the New Testament. You're implying that the monotheistic Jews in the New Testament somehow had a completely radically different concept. But no, because we don't have to go far from the beginning in Genesis all the way down. The New Test or the Old Testament is there's a vast number of plural words, as Anthony pointed out, plural nouns, plural uh, adjectives, plural prepositions, plural verbs all over the place that cannot be explained only um, in the context of Trinitarianism. It doesn't violate monotheism unless you're Unitarian. And they're only explained in the context of Trinitarianism. And then when we go to the New Testament, there are several places where the New Testament authors identify the Son as the Yahweh of the Old Testament. For instance, one of my favorite ones, there's, there's so many, I won't go through all of them, but um, there's two, actually, that I, um, that I use often. And one of them is, in, as it pertains to evangelism, Romans chapter 10. Now, keep in mind, there's no reason in the world why your evangelism should not include the deity of Christ and the concept of the Trinity. If we really believe that is the very marrow of the gospel, that God the Father sent God the Son and God the Holy Spirit regenerates sinners, this is the gospel. There is no gospel outside a triune nature of God. Don't be afraid to preach def, uh, definitive doctrine in your evangelism. Jesus did it. Do you, do you ever notice Jesus' evangelical presentation? You ever read his own presentation? John chapter 3, his conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he, first he starts off with a pre beautiful presentation of regeneration and the Spirit and God the Spirit of regeneration. And then he moves after the necessity of being born again, he moves to his pre-existence in verse 13. A beautiful affirmation that he existed. He says, nobody has ascended into the heavens except the one who descended ek to urano from the heavens. And many manuscripts, it's very interesting because there is a lot of evidence for this. Many manuscripts have a clause at the end, who is always in heaven. And we have a, um, a, a clause that's very interesting because it, it's attached to Jesus' preexistence, ha'on, uh, the one always being, so the one always in heaven. So he talks about regeneration, God the Spirit, he affirms his preexistence, then we get to 15 through 19, he affirms the depravity of man, how they love the darkness. He affirms his distinctions with the Father, and he affirms that he's God in the flesh by claiming he's the Son of God, that the Father sent the Son. He's claiming these, this definitive presentation of himself, this definitive presentation of the nature of God. Why can't we do that in our evangelism? Be definitive. 
Don't be like all, you know, so many, unfortunately, they throw out John 3.16 and the love of God and that's it. Don't be afraid to submit doctrine like Jesus did. So in terms of the Trinity in the old and new, there's many places in the New Testament where the authors identify Christ as the Yahweh of the Old Testament. For example, in Romans chapter 10, in Paul's beautiful address in chapter 10, where he says in verse 9, whoever homo legeo confesses, factually agrees, whoever confesses, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm going to read it this way, and I'll tell you why. Jesus Christ as Yahweh and believes that God the Father, that God raised him from among the corpses, you will be saved. Now, if you follow the pronoun trail, whoever calls upon him, um, he's the same Lord. The referential identity is the same, starting in verse 9. Jesus. Jesus. Then when he gets to verse 9, he says the same Lord. He's not talking about a different Lord. Then when he gets to verse 13, whoever calls upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. Paul identifies Jesus as the Yahweh of Joel 2.23. And then what we already heard today in, uh, or 2.32, and what we already heard today in Hebrews 1.10, where the Father, this is the last one I want to present because it's so strong, where the Father literally, directly addresses. Grammatically speaking, he's, he's providing a direct address to the Son. He's saying, you, 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 Lord, you, Lord. And he's quoting now. Now, the author's not speaking. He's, he's quoting the Father. And the Father says, you, Lord, citing now, Psalm 102, 25 through 27, you, Yahweh, you, you, Lord, Kuri, it's a vocative case there, meaning he's addressing the Son. You, Lord, in the beginning, lay the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hand. How is it that the Father affirms Jesus as the Yahweh of Psalm 102? Only in a context of Trinitarianism. So when we look at the Old Testament, and we, we heard ample example of the Old Testament evidence for the pre-existence of Christ, not only with the plural verbs and plural words, but also with the angel of the Lord and so on and so forth, the Son of Man in Daniel 7. So it's something that, it, it, and unfortunately, Christians need to embrace that it's the same God in the Old Testament as in the New Testament, and our requirements of salvation is the same in the Old Testament. Abraham was justified through faith alone. The requirements have not changed. The method of justification is the same. He justifies through faith alone. All right. One final question here. If we had a chance as a Christian, we had a, a Muslim in front of us who's even entertaining the thought of cracking open our Bible and reading it. Is there a place you would suggest they go to and read first? Yeah, and this goes back to my prior answer, Moses. Jesus said that if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe me. And he also says, if those who have been taught of God will come to me, how would they be taught of God in order to come to him? It's, it's assuming they've heard somewhere uh, from God, and that begins with Moses. I really, I mean, think of how the New Testament uh, speaks, and it's, uh, it's constantly assuming and relying upon the Old Testament. You, you know, you can't... Uh, where do all these things come from? There, there's a background to all of this. But I think, think for example, of John 1.14. I mean, I, I'm amazed, you know, that, that anybody can, can read through the prologue of John's gospel and not think it teaches the deity of Christ. Forget verse 1, right? I, I, can, I can start cutting out verses left and right from John's prologue, and I'm going to still end up, if there's any verse left in the prologue, I've still got the deity of Christ. But just think of verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Every line of that is just pregnant with Old Testament meaning. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It uses the word used to refer to God dwelling in the tabernacle, right? And it, it's back, it's talking about God's glory dwelling in the tabernacle. Exodus 40, what does it say? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. You know, Israelites hearing that and thinking, what does that mean? Because right? he's read Moses. 
He knows what that's talking about. It also says full of grace and truth. Go back and look at Exodus when God declares his name to Moses and he says, you know, uh, abounding in, in, uh, in grace and loving kindness. It, it would translate into Greek the same way that it does in John 1, uh, 14. Okay? Over and over again, Christ's deity is being affirmed in, in the New Testament. But you miss that over and over again if you're not familiar with the Old Testament. So I, I do think it's very important to do that. And it's not just, you know, we're focusing on the doctrine of God, but it's not just the doctrine of God. It's the doctrine of everything, right? That all goes back to the preparatory foundational stuff that you find in the Old Testament. Um, you know, I think when Jesus was talking about uh, the necessity of being born again in John 3, you know, Jesus, you know, we, we might all be thinking, well, where does that come from? You know, you know, we're still thinking, you know, we're like Nicodemus, but but what does he say to Nicodemus? He says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? He's assuming that this is talked about before. Where? Well, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. If you don't know where that is, you need to go back and read Moses <laughs> and the prophets. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that's a good point. I think a, a lot of times in Christianity, I was just you know, we're talking to Eddie. I said, yeah, we're New Testament Christians. We kind of like leave the old and we, and we don't see these relationships and they're there and they're all over the place. Anyway, with that, that ends our, our panel discussion. Thank you, everybody. We're going to reconvene at 7.30 for our debate. Nope.